Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I'll give you a tour of Weldon's Practical Needlework Volume 5. I have a 16th century stocking that I knit and want to share with you, and I have a little bit to tell you about this year's Finish It February. So let's get started. Uh, I do want to mention that there are no tidbits for today's episode. I do have a bunch of links in my tidbits file to share with you, but it takes quite a bit of time to synthesize the information for a given tidbit. And that might mean reading articles, watching videos, gathering additional information and links for context, collecting images, and then finally scripting the information so that I can communicate the tidbit coherently. Uh, I've been spending my information seeking time in, in the recent weeks on historic stocking research, which really hasn't left me time to spend on tidbits, but they will return. In December 2022, I purchased a 12 volume set of Weldon's Practical Needlework. These are facsimile copies of the first 12 years Weldon's published its popular series starting in 1886. These facsimile copies were published by Piecework Magazine in the early 2000s, and each volume represents one full year of monthly issues, with each issue devoted to a specific needle craft like knitting, crocheting, edgings, patchwork, macrame, tatting, embroidery, all kinds of things. And each week I've been giving you a tour of one of these volumes. Piecework no longer sells these hard copy facsimile copies, but they do sell digitized copies of the knitting and crocheting issues on their website. Let's go to the overhead and explore what volume five has for us. So this is the facsimile edition of Weldon's Practical Needlework, volume five. So in 1890, there were four issues of Weldon's that year that were devoted to knitting. And the other issues were Montmelic, which I think is embroidery. There was cro the three issues on crochet, and there were the first three series of drawn thread work. So every year they're introducing another type of needlework, which I find interesting. And then they had uh, an issue on netting as well. So let's take a look at the knitting. This is something that I find interesting. They have a full page of the volume devoted to advertising all of their other publications, like useful books for ladies, toilet hints and what they mean by that is you know makeup and beauty and hair and all that kind of things etiquette paper flowers all kinds of, of things like always they have various things like trims and baby items and stockings so these are a gentleman's stocking knit in scotch plaid pattern there's a you know baby's bonnet there is an a doily that's an eight pointed star there are some anklets to keep the leg warm, a uh, lady's mitten. They've got a beaded collarette. And here you've got an under vest. It looks very much like a sweater, but this is meant to be worn underneath. Gentlemen's drawers, more stockings. Now I wanna uh, take a little closer look at this stocking. So if you've been following my adventures with that a Norwegian sock, you will recognize the profile of this type of heel. It's a shaped common heel. Weldon's called it a manufacturer's heel. So when I first saw Dagren's stocking or Dagren's sock, I recognized the shape of the heel and said, oh, well, that's just a, a manufacturer's heel or a shaped common heel. But rather than using a double bind off as we did in Dagren's sock, the way that the two halves of the heel are joined together underneath is using a three needle bind off. The other thing that's interesting though about this heel is that it's knit in a different color. And so you knit the heel down to this point and then you switch colors. And when you are picking up stitches, you use this color to pick up stitches along this half of the heel on either side, and you're knitting the sole separately. Then you come back and you use the initial yarn to pick up stitches uh, on either side 
uh, and you are knitting the instep back and forth and then it gets sewn together at the end. Apparently this white sole was very fashionable at that time, uh, but this also allows you to take out the sole and re-knit it if you need to uh, later on. We've got a little baby's Spencer, the, a wedge pattern vest. So a vest is uh, like an underwear, undershirt, that kind of thing. So this gentleman's tartan hose is kind of interesting. So one of the things that I thought was interesting about those Argyle socks, they explain that the wool must be wound in separate balls, a half ounce in each ball, and to avoid long loose threads passing along the inside of the stocking, one ball is kept for each diamond and practically 12 balls are in use at the same time. This is rather troublesome and great care must be taken that they do not get entangled. The most durable wool for wear is the best Scotch fingering yarn and then they explain the colors. A novice in this kind of knitting may use only two needles, long ones, and work for the leg forwards and backwards in rows and shape the foot in two separate pieces in the manner explained in Knitting the Gentleman's Striped Sock, page 10, number 12 of Weldon's Practical Work Series. The tartan pattern will work quite correctly on two needles by following the directions. The seam stitch not being observed, meaning the pearl column of stitches that you usually have at the back of a stocking at this point, which helps you mark where the shaping is going. The seam stitch not being observed, but being knitted like an ordinary stitch. The heel also will shape nicely as below and the instep and the sole will be worked separately and the stocking when completed will be sewn around the foot and up the leg. For working the stocking on four needles as our model is worked, the first stitch upon the first needle must be employed as a seam stitch. And after working it at the end of every round, turn the work, slip the seam stitch and work back as the stocking must for convenience of neatness and having no loose threads at the back be knitted forwards and backwards alternately plain and pearl. So what they're saying is that you are that you can work this either flat like is often worked for intarsia socks or you can work intarsia in the round and they explain how to do that. So I thought that was really interesting to see that explained in a book from 1890. So now you've got more like slippers, you've got a looped cape, you've got a little knitted ball, um, a little sailor doll for a child. You've got different cuffs and collarettes and things. They, they seem to be liking these loop um, things. The child's <laughs> toy whip. We've got some quilt. Um, squares that you can do, uh, some more baby booties and socks, a little sailor jersey for a child, little, they're calling these overalls, which is kind of interesting. We'd call those leggings probably today. A lady's under sleeve and some puffed knitting. So these are edgings. This whole uh, issue is devoted to edgings that you could apply to sleeve cuffs or pillowcases or various different types of things. So now we come to the 15th series and this is something that caught my eye. It says American overshoes or bag slippers. And they're saying these shoes, which are made exactly in the shape of a bag, are intended to draw over a kid boot for extra warmth when traveling. The Americans wear them over their boots for walking in frosty weather, as the roughness of the wool upon the icy ground is a sure preventative against slipping. I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't know that I'd wear a wool bag around my uh, feet in order to avoid slipping, but here's what that looks like. So it is a little bag looks like a bag and then you wear it over your shoes and you have this little ribbon that can tie it closed. So I guess if you were wearing leather soled boots that that might help uh, somewhat. I just thought that was really interesting that they were saying this was an American thing. I wonder if it actually was, if anybody over here ever actually wore something like that. You've got more little baby items, little knitted shirts and vests and, and a gentleman's cotton nightcap. And then you've got a lady's vest, which is interesting. They've got some gores here for the bust points here. 
This is interesting, a muffler and chest protector combined. So it must be like what we would call a dickie today where it like goes over the neck and then you have a front and a back that tucks into your, your coat. More children's socks and gaiters, booties. Uh, and then that's it for this particular volume of Weldon's. Back in September, I wrapped up my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. And I had this kind of vague idea that I would like to do something similar to that, but for socks and stockings. I just wasn't quite sure what that project would look like. Like what would my goals be? What would I be trying to understand better? When I started my sweater project, I didn't even realize I was starting what would turn out to be a long-term project. Uh, I hadn't even planned to knit the sweater. I was trying to avoid knitting that first sweater. And then once I started it, I was trying to find a way to not have to knit all the way through it to answer the questions that I had about its construction. But during the process of knitting that sweater, I became, I was learning so much and became so intrigued and I was reading so many other sweater patterns and realizing that what I thought I knew about uh, sweaters and knitting and all of that kind of thing, uh, what I thought I knew about what was going on in that time period in the early 20th century just wasn't true. And so I wanted to explore the evolution of the hand knit sweater during this time period when sweater patterns were first being published up until the point when the internet began providing a sweater pattern. So really it ended up being a time frame where it was published patterns. So stockings have a much longer history than sweaters. They predate written patterns. And I just wasn't sure what I, what the goal would be for the project. Clearly I wanted to learn new things, but I don't like to just learn something individual. I like to learn things within a greater context so that I have a better understanding of history, social history, knitting history, uh, all of that in the history of this particular garment or accessory. So I'm, I'm looking to give myself context and I have to figure out, well, how am I going to go about learning the things that I think would be interesting? First of all, like what do I think would be interesting? And then how am I going to frame that project? What I've learned about these long-term projects is that it takes me a while to figure out what it is I want to learn. Uh, and a lot of it can't be learned until I've gotten part way in and, and I kind of start in this direction and then go that direction and then go this direction for a while. So uh, what happened was this project is that a, a sock knit by a Norwegian lady fell into my lap. Somebody wanted to know how to knit those types of stocking uh, socks that their relative had knit. And it had some really unusual techniques in it. And I learned a lot uh, about, I learned a new technique, but I also learned a lot about how a knitter of her time uh, who in place would have learned to knit socks. And there were quite a few things that were different than what I would have expected. That ended up being what I think of as the first project, the first sock in this larger project, but I really didn't know where I wanted to go to next. What I kind of hit on was this period in history where woven hosiery, made, you know, hosiery made from woven fabrics um, sewn on the bias so that they had some stretch, that overlap period uh, between those and when knitted stockings were first being worn. So there was an overlap for maybe a couple of hundred years. I was curious about uh, that transition from uh, woven stockings to knitted stockings. And the stockings that I had seen in museums tended to be those of the aristocracy or the wealthy. So those were the ones that were sort of valuable and well-preserved and of great interest. And so those were these silk stockings that were knit probably by guild members. The earliest ones would have been probably knit in Spain and then imported up into uh, Western, Northern uh, European countries. And so that was the kind of 
of stocking I was thinking of in terms of its construction, even if I didn't want to knit something at that fine a gauge. But I really, I just don't know much about the 16th century <laughs> at all. So I was kind of floundering in terms of my specific knowledge of knitting history and social history and a history of them of the British monarchy and and all of the all of the people who are known to have worn silk stockings and which ones were known to be famous and and could help me create this timeline. I've been re reading and rereading books that I have in my library and also buying some books that are new to me and several people have sent along information that's been really helpful for, to me to understanding what was going on in that 16th century time period. But I got several comments in several videos about a particular book called The Typical Tutor. And they mentioned that, because um, that's you know, 16th century and you could find out what people were wearing at that time period and it's this book. And so I looked up the book and it's kind of an expensive book. And so it's a little bit on the fence about uh, buying it because I didn't know what was in it and is was it going to have things that I would find really valuable or just a passing interest like that was a lot of money to spend and I decided well maybe I'll go ahead and buy it but it's a, a book that was written in the UK and it's being shipped from there it's not available from a seller here in the US and so the shipping was another 50% on top of it so by the time we talked you know the cost of the book the shipping the tax it was like $114 and I thought I just don't know well then I got another comment from somebody again about this typical tutor book and that person said they had received it for Christmas and they told me kind of what was in there that was would be of specific interest to me, that there were stockings in there, instructions for how to knit them, and that they did not use this shaped common heel that I had assumed was the type of heel that was used in stockings at that time. Uh, and so that was intriguing to me that there, there was more to it. So I, I bought a used copy of one of the author's earlier books, which is called The Tudor Tailor, and talked about clothing construction um, from that time period. And so I could see that she really knew what she was talking about. So I went ahead and I ordered the book. It came, uh, uh, the typical Tudor, it came to me in the mail last Friday um, while I was recording last week's Casual Friday. And so on Saturday, I started digging into it and I just, I went right to the chapter that's on knitted items because I didn't care as much about like other clothing items. I skipped all the introductory information and went right to the stuff that I wanted to know about. And as I read through it, it was like, and I was working through the process of how to knit these stockings. There's so many things that all of a sudden became clear to me that had been really, uh, confusing to me when I'd been reading 19th century stocking um, instructions because those were all based on these formulas and assumed proportions and they never gave any information like gauge or actual finish size or the actual size of the leg that was going to be wearing it and so there was a lot of guesswork about what the size would be and I couldn't figure out how these could possibly work. So what was so interesting to me is how different the stocking was constructed that was for a more common person would have been knit by a common person uh, for a common person at a gauge similar to what we would knit today um, based on stockings that are in the museum collections and as I was reading this information I kept thinking the sound, these thought, the, it, it seems so familiar to me. It's like this is the same information I had just been rereading. And this journal, which I told you guys about last week, this was this journal on textiles where this was the journal, the, the issue where they decided to set some standards for how to describe knitted items in archaeological uh, finds because there really hadn't been anything defined well. Uh, in archaeology and part of that is because knitting is just so so much newer than weaving is weaving goes back before written history and so we have a lot more evidence and a lot more ways of discussing that 
And so I thought, geez, they, they seem to be talking about the same socks that they talk about in here. And because they have a couple of articles in here that demonstrate the usage of the vocabulary um, that they're proposing. And what I noticed was one of the authors of the article in here is Jane Malcolm Davies, and she is one of the authors of this book. And so then I kind of really looked her up. I would never doubt anything that she says, and I would totally trust her research and, and her findings. It's one of those things where, you know, I read something a few years ago, well, that's interesting, and then I'm rereading it now, and then I'm rereading, and then I'm reading something new now, I'm going, oh, oh, and putting the pieces together. In this past week, I knit the stocking, I knit one stocking from this book, and it fits me. So I wanna to go to the overhead and I wanna talk through the stocking and all the really unusual things about it and some of the stuff that I've learned um, because it's just a really interesting, I think. The book has instructions for how to knit three different lengths of stocking. So a calf length stocking, a knee high length stocking, or a thigh high stocking. And for the knee length stocking, you can really decide where on your knee that you want it uh, to be. Um, the thigh length stocking, you measure your circumference seven or eight inches above the top of your kneecap. For the knee high, you measure around the largest portion of your calf. And then if you're going to have just a sock that comes up to the calf, you just use the measurement that you take around the circumference of your foot because the assumption is the circumference of your foot and the circumference of your ankle are going to be about the same size. You'll need the same size too. But that's always how sock formulas work. It's not always how actual people's feet work, but that's how it works. And so then the idea is that you ca if you were making the thigh high, you'd cast on, you'd knit straight for a while, and then you'd decrease down to the amount that you need for the calf circumference, you'd knit straight, and then you would decrease again down to the amount you need for the lower leg, uh, and you'd go straight, and then you would work your heel. And this number that you have here is what you would use for your foot. Um, so let me just show you that I, I decided to knit, to knit a knee length one that was from the top of the knee. So this is, is what the stocking looked like. You'll, you'll notice there's no ribbing at the top. It's completely in stockinette. And then there's this little bit of a heel, this little wedge. It's sort of like half of a standard short row heel, only it's done in garter stitch. And then the toe is knit the same length all the way until you have like a half an inch of the top of your toe left. So whatever toe of yours is the longest when there's a half an inch left, then you do the decreases and you just do them one decrease round in a row. And what happens is that uh, the sole is actually shorter than the top of the instep and these decreases end up being underneath your foot. So let me try this on and I'll show you what it looks like. See if I can get this in here. Get my, I don't know, think I can get my knee up here. Um, so here it's the stocking is coming up to the top of the knee. And one of the things you'll notice is where the decreases are. The decreases are placed randomly. You do, do, you do two decreases as you're doing the shaping. You'll do two decreases in around, but they do not have them lined up the back with like a seam stitch on either side. They weren't doing that. Apparently, the idea is that this is actually stretchier than if you have everything lined up in the same place. I thought that was really uh, interesting. And then you get down to the ankle and the leg has to stretch down to the bottom. So the circumference of the leg has to stretch down here. And then there's just this little bit of heel done in garter stitch. It's like the second half of a short row heel um, and then you continue on to the foot and you can see you you don't see any of the decreases up here they're all underneath my foot here so one of the things I was really worried about is because I have this long heel diagonal is that this would never go on my foot um, but I was working at a loose enough gauge um, that I have plenty of room at the heel here or at the ankle here. So it was roomy enough here. And the gauge I was working at was like seven to, I think maybe seven and a half stitches per inch. So that's much looser 
than the gauge I would sort normally knit my socks at when I am um, knitting with this kind of yarn. I'm usually working at nine stitches per inch. So even if I knit something that's the same circumference, if I'm working at a firmer gauge, it doesn't stretch as much as something that's knit at a looser gauge. So, um, so because this is looser, it was, and it was able to stretch a little bit more. And so I, it does fit across here. It's, 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 snug there's not any extra room, extra room right here i don't know that this would be the method i would prefer knitting uh, socks or stockings with going forward but it, it ended up being much more it fits way better than i expected is what i should say i i just did not expect it um, to fit this well so one of the things that Knitting this stocking really helped me understand is the proportions of my feet relative to what is expect or of my legs relative to what is expected by these formulas. So I've often said that my ankles are smaller than average and um, but my heel is taller than average. And so that those two fit differences mean that it's really challenging to get things to fit across that heel diagonal. And so I usually have to modify the heel in some way. My ankle and my ball of foot are the same size and that is expected. So that is something that is pretty easy for me. It's just having to, to come up with a way to adjust the heel. But because we don't knit stockings nowadays and I, I've never, I, and I don't know how they're supposed to fit. Um, and I haven't seen instructions that explain the process the way that they explain it in the tutor, um, the typical tutor. I was really at a loss with 19th century charts where they would say they would have these, they call them scales of stockings or something like that, where they'll have like six or seven different sizes and they'll tell you how many to cast on, uh, how many rounds to work straight, uh, how many decreases to work over, how many rounds, you know, they'll tell you the, how the decrease rate and then, and they'll tell you that process of going straight, decrease, straight, decrease, and they'll tell you exactly how many rounds to do that. They never tell you what the gauge is, <laughs> stitch gauge or row gauge. So you don't know what size this stocking is. And so anytime I tried to figure it out and, and I thought, well, if it was like 10 stitches per inch, how big around would that ankle be? And then I'll work backwards and figure out how big the thigh is. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. There's no, no way that that would fit. Or if I, if I guessed, oh, well, maybe the, the gauge is eight stitches per inch, then that would fit me around the thigh. And if, but if I do the formula, it's gonna be huge around the ankle. Were they wearing loose stockings around the ankle? Like, how were they wearing these? How are they supposed to fit? And so then in, the, in this book, because I told you the different measurements to take and then the process for calculating the, the shaping rate based on your own row gauge um, and what, what the stitch count you had when you're starting and the stitch count that you're gonna need when you're um, finishing that shaping shaped area. Um, then that, that was pre really you know pretty straightforward for me to figure it out. But I was looking at their charts they had three different foot circumferences as examples. They had eight and a half, nine and a half, and ten and a half. Well, mine was eight and a half. And then they had a chart with five sizes of calf circumferences and like the number of stitches that you would need. You find the one that you're closest to and you use that stitch count. And they're telling you to knit at a gauge of seven to eight stitches per inch. And so, you know, if you're around here and you're knitting somewhere in seven to eight, eight stitches per inch, it will fit you. It might be a little tighter, a little looser on you than somebody else who, who's knitting a little bit firmer, a little bit tighter. But as long as you're in that gauge range, it's going to fit you. Um, and then they have a, ch a similar chart for the thigh. Again, numbered one through five. It took me a while until I, I, it wasn't until I compiled this that I realized, oh, I have the smallest foot circumference, but I, my calf circumference is smaller than the smallest one, but my thigh circumference is between the second and third. So now I understand why I couldn't make sense of the 
formulas and proportions that they were talking about. Because sometimes they'll even say, however long your foot is, cast on enough stitches, you know, to equal one and a third that measurement. I'm like, how is my foot length an indication of how big my thigh is? <laughs> so I think they had the they had these imagined perfect proportions that didn't necessarily align with the reality of what somebody's leg was, and they never explained how to actually the process of knitting something. They were completely feeding exact stitch counts, exact row counts, but not providing measurements and not providing gauges. So that's why I was so confused for so long. Um, but now I can interpret those 19th century stocking patterns with a better understanding of what they're expecting versus what the reality of my own personal measurements are. So I want to talk a little bit about the elements of this sock, like there's no ribbing, uh, and then this, this heel construction, which is so interesting. The aristocracy were getting their like silk stockings from like the guilds in like Spain and Italy and, and those places. And those stockings were knit with an inelastic yarn, so it would have been silk. Uh, and they were knit using the same construction proportions that a woven hose would have been. They would have had that shaped common heel, it probably would have been longer than that, and there would have been a gusset involved as well. But this is the type of, of heel you would have seen, and they would have needed this taller heel and this gusset because they're working with an inelastic, very fine uh, gauge yarn, and they want it to fit like woven hose, only without the seams. So. But the common people are going to be, aren't going to be wearing those silk hose. Uh, they're going to be wearing wool. And wool is stretchier. And so they wouldn't have needed to knit that um, common heel. And they wouldn't have necessarily known how to do a purl stitch in order to knit something flat uh, back and forth. The purl stitch just hadn't made it to England yet. Um, so you would knit in stockinette. They did sometimes have some rounds of pearls at the top to kind of as a stopgap for uh, a, a garter that was tied around, but they did that by just turning and working in the opposite direction in knit stitches. So if you were knitting in the round, you were knitting in stockinette. Um, but if you were knitting flat, you were going to get garter stitch. So because you have this stretchy fabric, um, that allows you to work something that doesn't have a gusset and um, it just has this little heel turn here. So the difference between this kind of heel turn and the one, and one you'd see with a, an hourglass short row heel is it's just the bottom half of the heel. They don't have this part. So if you're working a standard hourglass short row heel, you're, you're getting this extra length extension in the leg down to the heel from working this half of the heel. And then this part right here um, helps you meet up with where um, the stitches that are on hold on the instep are. So normally you would knit a sock leg down to here, down to the ankle, and then you would knit, uh, nowadays you'd knit your short row heel. And then after you're done with the heel, you can return to working in the round using these instep stitches. But if you are, are not working this half of the heel, like here, this part is, this part of the leg is stretching down to here and then you're just working a little bit to extend it. And it's not as long as that either. I think the heel that I worked just maybe an inch and a half in length. So the result is that you have a sock that is further along on the instep than it is on the back of the heel. It's, it's kind of at an angle. And so as you're working the sock, the instep is kind of ahead of where the sole is in terms of the tube. Because when you're turning, your leg is turning this heel, you need more length to a sock to go around the, this corner than you need to go around this corner. And, and so that little bit of a heel provides some of that extra length, but not quite enough. And then you get the stretch that helps to fill in some of that as well. But that's why the top of the sock ends up longer. But it also helped me understand 
a heel that's the flegal heel, uh, which is typically done toe up, or the strong heel, which is the same type of heel, it's just done cuff down. That type of heel, you get to the ankle and you start doing increases to increase the circumference of the sock to accommodate that, that distance. But because you're, you're continuing to work the instep, the instep is getting longer and longer and longer while you're doing that. And so that creates an even longer instep at the top. And I've never understood like how people can like the strong heel in the fit because I've always found the top of the heel to be too long. I did see a sock pattern a few years ago where the, the, with a strong heel, she worked some short rows on the sole. Uh, for a while to kind of catch up with where the instep was and then she worked the toe. But I also think that this, this method here where you work almost to the end and then you work these decreases very quickly in the round so that they sit underneath. That was an ingenious way of approaching construction. Like if you were just figuring out how you were going to make this work, I think this is really, really ingenious. So the next thing I have in store is I want to knit uh, a garter uh, so I can try, try this on with a garter. And I also am thinking about dyeing this stocking. I'm not planning on knitting a second one. I knit one, it fits me. I have no like place to wear this. Not like with socks where I can actually wear the socks. I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? I'm not gonna learn anything new by knitting a second one. But I'm thinking about dyeing it. I'm thinking about uh, dyeing it scarlet because that would have been a really fashionable color back then. And I also, one of the things I'd like to do this year is get more into dyeing. I bought a bunch of stuff for doing dyeing in the past couple of years and I just started doing some dyeing projects and then there's some more that I would like to do this year and particularly as I start doing these stocking projects I would like to uh, dye them. What I thought was interesting is that that is the this is the order in which they would have done their uh, dyeing back then. They would have knit the stocking and then they would have taken it to somebody who does dyeing professionally. Like some people would dye some things in their own home, but most of the time you take it to the person in your village who did the dyeing. That would be a common thing to happen is to have it um, be knit first and then if you decided to dye them, take them to somebody who would dye them. So that's my plan is to, uh, to dye this and then also knit a garter. And I'm, I'm just reading so m I have so many things that I'm reading and rereading and trying to kind of put a timeline together so that I have a better understanding of what happened in what order during the 16th century. And then I'll figure out what it is I want to do next. In the, the museum that, that holds the stockings that have this kind of construction, they have some other sock heels that were interesting rather than knitting this kind of wedge short row uh, in garter stitch some people knit an actual rectangle of garter stitch and no turn and then but picked up stitches along the sides and so that would have given them you know additional length but also a, even more length because you would have had more stitches when you pick up stitches along the sides and then maybe they would have decreased them out. And they, they apparently hadn't figured out how to uh, place decreases in a symmetrical way. They always used to use knit two together. And a lot of times it was just randomly placed. Or maybe they were trying to work out how to put them um, symmetrical but didn't, didn't quite get them to work out uh, correctly. So... Uh, and they weren't going to rip them out and redo them. It's like hey, the sock is going to function. You just you figure it out as you as you go as you knit through them. I've just been finding this really really fascinating. So I that is kind of what I'm going to be on the lookout for I think is the methods of of knitting stockings that would have been worn by common people because I think that that the evolution of that knitting process um, could be more interesting than the silk stockings, which were really based on the woven hose. But I don't know. I will knit a, another stocking or two, and then I, as I learn more, I will figure out better what it is I'm trying to do with this project. As I mentioned, 
In last week's Casual Friday, I will be hosting Finish It February on my channel and in my Ravelry group again this year. Finish It February is a time to pull out all of your UFOs, your unfinished projects, in order to remind yourself of their existence uh, and then make decisions about the future of those projects. Do you want to actually finish them? Are you, are you finished with them now and want to do something about them or are you feeling ambivalent about them? I did a series of Casual Friday segments last year on ideas for how to make those decisions, how to go through your pile of UFOs. And I will link to those segments, uh, to those Casual Friday episodes down in the description. As always, I will create two discussion threads in my Ravelry group for Finish It February. One will be created today and opened up. And this one will be for anyone who wants to interpret Finish It February in any way that makes sense to them. So you might use Finish It February to fix things, mend things, uh, to use up leftovers in your stash, or to sort through not just the UFOs, but to also go through your stash and get rid of yarn you know you, know, you won't uh, ever use. There are lots of ways to interpret Finish It February to make it work for you. The point is to just uh, go through it and make decisions about those things. Many people will post photos of their UFO pile and what they plan to do with the different things. Uh, it's a way for the community to really see what we're working on and to cheer each other on as we successfully meet whatever goals might um, we might have for this February. Again, in this thread, you can interpret Finish It February in whatever way works for you. The second thread will be created on February 1st, and it will be a no chat thread. So this is where you can post photos of the completed items. If you post photos in that thread, you are giving me permission to use your photos in the end of month montage that I create for the for Casual Friday. So next week, I'll show you what my plans are for Finish It February, and I hope you will join in the fun. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.